My name's Ethan. I'm 26, and I love the internet. It's vast, almost as big as the real world. On the internet, people play, work, entertain themselves, study, get information, express their opinions, buy and sell, and do so many other things that are also done in the tangible world, sometimes even creating significant events in what we biasly call reality. However, like any large and complex space, the internet has its dark alleys, its forbidden passages. I'm referring to the deep web. This is the hidden face of the internet, the massive iceberg of which we barely know the tip that emerges above the waters. Most people are unaware of it, but the deep web represents about 90% of the information in cyberspace. Ever since I learned that the deep web existed, I wanted to get to know it and dive into its murky waters. I had my fears, but my curiosity was much more significant, and after a while of thinking about it, I decided to at least take a little look. I started by entering directly to level 3. Here begins what is forbidden on the official web. Pages whose characters are randomly dropped. Pages that cannot be displayed in search engines and that you cannot see even if you copy the entire link and paste it in the address bar. In this level, there are strange, disturbing, or simply useless things. Webs abandoned for more than 13 years. Materials that by copyright are not found in the official web, or were found, but are no longer there. Markets of weapons, drugs, instructions on how to make bombs and other things that lend themselves to the illegal, and videos and photos of murders. It was already said that in the previous level, there was solid gore material, but here, there are live murders, assassins, and even trade in human organs. As the hours passed, I started getting bored and advanced to the next level. If in the previous story there were compromising things for governments, in this level, there are military secrets in the most lurid and inhumane state projects. Here, you will know what missile that countries are hiding is, what cybernetic weapons are hidden, and who has the most lethal biological weapons, things like that. I entered out of curiosity to one of the famous Red Room videos, and I saw how they murdered a young man of no more than 20 years old. The boy was begging for mercy with all his strength, told them that he had family waiting for him, that he never did wrong to anyone. Before murdering him, they sent a poll to the viewers asking them if they should let him live, to which I voted yes. Unfortunately, the rest of the viewers disagreed with me, so the man moved forward again and opened the young man's neck with a precise and quick movement. The camera zoomed in on his gaze as he made a futile attempt to cover his wound by lowering his neck. So, as quickly as it started, the show was over. The lights were turned off, while some men came in to clean up to prepare for the next show. I felt like throwing up and decided to leave as quickly as possible. I wanted to advance to the next level, where there were no more murders, but state secrets and information that people would never know. It took me a long time to get in, but when I finally got in, I understood why everyone stayed in the lower levels. As soon as I logged in, my PC restarted by itself without anything weird popping up on the screen or the power going out. When the reboot process was finally complete, I saw that my hard drive had been wiped. On the entire desktop, there was only one file from the notes blog, placed right in the center of the screen, as if to make me notice it. I opened it. Its message was brief, blunt, and somewhat threatening. Don't do it again. I got so scared that I didn't enter the deep web for several days. In that time, I reinstalled a few things to a backup I had of my data. I thought that was the worst of it, that losing all my data was the most significant punishment I could suffer. I was wrong. A few days later, my curiosity got the better of me, and I logged into Tor and entered the first deep web forum I could find. Of course, I wasn't even at an advanced level yet but my PC restarted by itself, and the data was deleted again. Although now, there was no message on the desktop. Was I banned from the deep web from my computer forever? 20 minutes after the reboot and formatting, I knew better. The doorbell rang. I asked who it was from the door's phone, and no one answered. Then, I went down to the front door of the building, but no one was there. Only an envelope was waiting for me, just under the door. 
It had no return address, addressee, or anything written on it, although I sensed it was for me. I went back upstairs to my apartment, went into my room, and just there, opened the envelope once I was sitting on my red carpet. Ethan, this is not a game. Don't do it again. Don't make us come after you. As I read it, my hands began to shake and tears slipped down my cheeks. Whoever they were, they knew who I was, where I lived, what I did, and when. To top it off, next to the message was a picture of me taken with my webcam. Next to it, pictures of my family, my friends, even my little sister who was still in kindergarten. In an act of desperation, I grabbed the phone and dialed the police number. I had no idea what to say to them when they answered. Deep inside, I knew there was nothing they could do. But before I answered, I saw through the computer's reflection a hooded man with his face covered coming right at me. When I turned around to defend myself, it was too late. The man grabbed my head and began slamming it against my keyboard. As he did so, I heard his voice, distorted by a device, telling me, I told you, this is not a game. I was still dizzy and thought about mustering all my strength to get away, but suddenly I felt a cold prick in my arm. A few seconds later, I became very sleepy and surrendering to whatever they had injected me with, I closed my eyes. When I woke up, my house was in perfect condition, but something was wrong with the computer. It wouldn't turn on. After checking in, I noticed that it was missing the hard drive, video card, processor, and RAM. The man who had visited me had taken the most expensive components and had rendered it useless. But at the time, I didn't care. I was so terrified that week. I asked at work to be transferred to another city. I never entered the deep web again, and I don't think I will ever try it again, no matter where I am in the world. Fate had been cruel to me, but after remembering how I was at the mercy of this man, asleep, it makes me think that, despite everything, I am fortunate to be alive. As someone who enjoys searching for the hidden, dark side of the internet, I was very interested in watching YouTube videos about Deep Web. Even though I was interested in the topic, I never found the courage to go in the Deep Web because I knew that serial killers, criminals, and all sorts of untrustworthy people would be there, and they could easily find my IP address as soon as I clicked on a website link. I knew that I should stay out of it, but when a friend of mine, whose name will not be given, came to my house to a sleepover, things changed. Let's call him Tom, even though that is not his real name. Obviously, I will not give my name as well, but you can call me Mia. Tom and I were really good friends. We were both into mysteries, crime stories, and biographies of serial killers. When he arrived at my house, we started to watch a documentary on Deep Web. We were both intrigued by the documentary. After we finished watching it, Tom told me that he would love to go into the deep web. I was scared to do that, and I knew I should have said no at that point, but I did not. Very foolishly, I said that we could try. His eyes sparkled with joy, and he rushed to my desktop. I joined him and we downloaded the browser that would make us be able to access the deep web. We found some links and went through them one by one. The first link was a website that was mainly about illegal trades of drugs and firearms. Even by entering this website, I felt the rush of adrenaline. Tom seemed to be a little bored. We opened the second link, which was also selling drugs, but also leather-made furniture. These furniture were made from a special leather that we instantly understood what it was. Human skin. Being someone who is aware of the dangers that comes just by entering the website, I felt the urge to close the computer, but Tom wanted to check out more links. On the third link, we saw a man with no legs. He had a mask of a very disgusting face. The mask had scars, big red eyes, and countless amount of teeth bursting out of the mouth portion of it. He was crawling in a dim room. The floor he was crawling on was filled with dried blood. He was making different kinds of animalistic sounds with his mouth. We watched him, 
As he crawled to the door of the room, he knocked on the door. He seemed like he was trying to escape the chamber. He scratched the iron door. He screamed and asked for help. At that moment, the door opened and a huge man rushed inside the room. He beat the legless man senselessly. With pain, he crawled to a corner and held his head. He was rocking back and forth and crying. The giant man approached the camera. He had a ski mask on him. His white shirt was filled with blood stains. As he came closer to the camera, he started to mash on his keyboard in haste. After a while, he started to speak. His voice was distorted as he spoke. Oh, we have new visitors. Hello there. Let's see who is here with us. As he said those words, I saw the blue light on my webcam turned on. That meant the webcam was on. He continued to talk. How are you tonight, Mia? I see that you have a friend with you. He looks like he does not deserve you. At that point, Tom and I were both scared. Tom unplugged the webcam quickly, and we heard the man's voice once again. Oh, I cannot see you anymore. You looked scared. Do not worry. I just want to be your friend. Now, show me your faces again, please. Of course, we did not open the webcam. We should have closed the computer at that point. But we were petrified by the fear we were feeling. He seemed angry that we did not plug in the webcam. He began to shout and said, Fine. If you do not want to show me your faces, I will come and see. As I rushed to unplug the computer, I could hear him shouting curses and describing how he was going to torture Tom and rape me. I unplugged my computer. There was a moment of silence. We were looking at each other while panting intensely. I said, what was that? We are doomed. That was the kind of stuff that I was afraid of, in a panicked tone. That was really scary, he said, and started to laugh. I do not think he will do that. He is just a pathetic psycho who wanted to scare us. I do not think he will find us, he said while still laughing. You do not understand, Tom. The fact that he was able to open my webcam remotely shows that he's capable of finding our location. He seemed really angry at us. He will definitely come here and murder us. Tom did not seem to understand the true nature of the event that happened. He held me and very calmly said, I really do not think he will try to find us, Mia. But if you are afraid to stay here, you can come and live with me for a week. After a week, we can check and see if it's safe for you to live here, and you can come back to your house. Is that okay for you? I approved his plan and started to pack my stuff. After an hour, I finished packing and we left my house. At first, I was constantly thinking about what happened. For a couple of days, I was incapable of sleeping. Even the thought of him knowing my name was enough to keep me awake. But after I got used to living in Tom's flat, I seemed to not think about what happened that often. My relationship with Tom became something more than a friendship. The sexual tension found its result in the couple of days I spent in his place. This, I believe, was the main reason that kept me from thinking about the man constantly. A week passed and we were both happy that I was staying with him but I started to miss being in my house. Considering the deal I made with Tom, it was time for me to go back to my place. When I told him, Tom understood and said that it was okay for me to go to my house. I left my clothes at his place, telling him that I'll be coming back. I left him and went to my home. When I arrived there, I noticed that my window was broken. I opened my door as fast as I could and started to look around. My house was a mess. My furniture was ripped into pieces. My mirrors were broken. Papers and any kind of belongings were scattered around the rooms. On the table, I found a letter. I opened the letter. It was from him. In the letter, he described how he came to see us but could not find us, how he stayed in my house for three days and searched for information, and how he found out mine and Tom's personal information. The letter ended with him stating that he was going to check Tom's address considering he was not able to find us in my house. In a hurry, I called Tom. There was no answer. Hoping that he was okay, I called the police and gave his address. I left my house and started to drive to his address. I drove as fast as I could and arrived there. 
As I ran to his flat, I saw the door open. With a sudden rush of adrenaline, I went in his place. At that moment, I saw his body lying on the floor with dozens of knife wounds on his body. I found the knife next to his body. As I held his body and started to cry, I heard rushing footsteps coming from outside the flat. I instinctively held the knife, thinking the sound was coming from the man. I remember feeling relieved when I saw that the person who was rushing here was a police officer. I asked for help, but the cop, seeing me holding a knife and standing before a dead body, drew his gun and ordered me to freeze. I tried to tell them that it was a misunderstanding, and I was not the killer, but they did not listen. They took me to the police station and told what happened but the evidence they found was telling a different story. They found my DNA all over his flat. They found my clothes. And, most importantly, they found my fingerprints on the murder weapon. I will go on trial next week. I am not afraid of going to jail. What scares me the most is that the man is still out there hunting innocent people like Tom and me. During the early 2000s, the internet's popularity and accessibility were booming. While in college, my friends and I would spend hours huddled around a computer screen browsing this new method of communication that was predicted to change the world. One evening, my college roommate asked me in a secretive whisper, despite living alone in her apartment, if I'd ever heard of the dark web. He explained the dark web was a secret side of the internet. No one could track, trace, or see any activity that went on there. He also explained it was a way of obtaining products that weren't exactly legal or obtainable elsewhere. So, how do we access it? That's the best part, he said, walking to my room. All you have to do is download some free software. We sat in front of my computer, downloaded something I'd never heard before, and we began our browsing. He navigated this side of the web with ease. I barely knew how to browse the regular internet, much less this dark and secretive version of it. He made an illegal substance purchase and smirked at me triumphantly as he shut down the computer. That's it? I asked. <laughs> That's it. Easy, huh? He gave me a thumbs up, indicating a successful and secretive transaction. It turns out that that wasn't it. The following week, I sat at my desk, ready to begin a research project. I opened my internet browser and began studying. My eyes flew through graphs and charts when, suddenly, the computer screen went dark. I assumed my monitor had overheated or the connection had malfunctioned. I rose from my chair to check when I noticed the screen wasn't entirely black. A cursor blinked on the screen. I stared and wondered if I imagined it. The cursor began typing, Hi, Brian. I see you. I, I, I stared, unblinking and breathing heavily. Bye for now. My computer screen returned to the previous page as if nothing had just happened. I wondered if this had been a hallucination induced by sleep deprivation and stress, that though deep down I, I knew it wasn't. I tried to push it aside and continue my work. <sighs> the next few days were normal, no more cryptic messages on my computer. But that's when the letter arrived. One evening as I arrived for work, I noticed the corner of a red envelope peeking under my doormat. Brian was written across the front. The back was sealed. I picked it up, looked around to see if anyone was watching, and entered my apartment. I ripped the seal open, blinded by adrenaline and fear. Dear Brian, it's nice to meet you. Though I feel I already know everything about you. Your mother is named Heather, your sister Michelle, and your father, Michael. You are 24 years old and were born in Madison, Wisconsin. You enjoy music by Metallica, horror movies, and eating Indian food. You spend too much money on coffee and alcohol. Your credit score is 540 because of your credit card debt. You have three pairs of shoes in your closet, ten clean shirts, and two pairs of jeans. I'll cut right to the chase. I request you send $10,000 to the address below. If you do not cooperate, I'll have to visit you. Trust me, you do not want that. You have two weeks. Ciao, Al. Mm. P.S. Going to the police will make all of this worse. Perhaps I'll need to visit your family, if you do. My my head flooded with questions and fears. How, how did he know all of this? Had he been inside my apartment? Was this a sick joke by my roommate? What did he mean by pay me a visit? What should I do? Huh. The next two weeks were hell. I couldn't sleep. 
I couldn't concentrate. Eyes followed me everywhere I went. Cars were tailing me. My roommate started acting oddly and reserved. My parents sounded afraid over the phone. My computer was slower than usual, though was I imagining everything? At the end of the two weeks, I decided not to send Al anything. This decision was derived mostly by my lack of $10,000, but I pretended to believe it was all a big scam. I came home from work Tuesday evening, exactly 14 days after receiving the letter. My roommate was spending the night at his girlfriend's place and I had the apartment to myself. I pretended not to remember what the night marked, but I was on edge. I tiptoed through and eyed every room, searching for abnormalities. There were none, until I entered my room. I cracked my room door open. My stomach dropped, and goosebumps covered my skin. My room was destroyed. My computer was on the ground. My mattress was flipped. My posters had been torn to shreds. Everything that was on my desk was scattered throughout the ground. My eyes shifted to the closet door. It was open, though barely. I heard light movement coming from inside. I approached, body shaking and sweating. Suddenly, banging at my front door thundered, stopping me cold. The strikes intensified and were joined by the screaming of my name. Brian McDonald! Brian McDonald! Open up! Open up! I tried to digest what was occurring. What was the bigger threat? What looked in my closet or, or, or outside? I stood mulling my options over, but a loud crack and crash came from the living room. My door had been knocked down. At that moment, my closet door began to open. A tall, slender figure stepped out. He wore a clown mask and a full, formal suit. He, he, he exited with a gun lifted in my direction. Hi, Brian, he said in a soft voice. I'm Al. Gun pointing at my head, continued, I'm sorry I have to do this, but I warned you that this would happen if you didn't fall. A gunshot rang. Nearly busting my eardrums. I anticipated blood, anticipated pain, but, but they never came. Instead, Al's gun-wielding arm came down first, followed by his entire body. His lifeless figure landed at my feet as blood began to pool around his head. Brian McDonald, this is the NYPD. I need you to take a step back and come with us. Tears were now rolling down my face. I turned and saw a young man in uniform's arm stretched out, offering a hand. I extended mine and he escorted me to the police station. At the station, Officer Harris explained, Al was a computer hacker terrorizing inexperienced dark web users for months. In that span, Al had blackmailed seven victims into sending him $70,000 and had brutally murdered another nine that had not complied. He kept to a 10-mile radius and only specific neighborhoods were targeted. The police recovered the letters and red envelopes of every victim and began connecting the puzzle pieces. They indicated they'd been following me for two weeks, going through my mail and tracking my internet browsing history. My internet searches regarding internet scams, internet threats, and the dark web led them to believe I was the next target. <laughs> they were correct, and they saved my life. It's been 17 years since that horrific day. I never browsed the dark web again, and while I hear it's still around, I'll never browse it again. Please, use this as a warning. While the police saved my life at the last minute, you may not be so lucky. Beware of the dark web.